Thank you. Good evening, fellow world dominators. So I thought I'd start by explaining this nonsense, which wasn't really part of my original talk, but it's now officially Saturday night, and Mr. Money Mustache is not supposed to be seen on a stage delivering an effing PowerPoint presentation on a Saturday night. So I thought at least I could enjoy a beer while I do this. So last night at the party, I set up this elaborate scheme with this guy, the, a cool neighbor of mine named Jonathan. And he was like, yeah, how about we'll get some beers and then I'll pass one up to the stage to you. And then he'll be like, this will help you out with your talk, Pete. And I thought that's great because that's totally in line with the community aspect of the WDS. <laughs> I mean, this is my neighbor helping another neighbor out while we're both here in Portland. But it turns out that uh, you can't really do that on this particular venue on this night because of some nonsense about like the, the liquor laws in Oregon or something. So you're going to have to use your imagination every time I take a sip from this. And I do need a drink sometimes when I'm talking. Just imagine this is a big, frosty, like Portland's best pale ale of some sort. <laughs> and we're all having it together. <laughs> and because I'm the last talk of the night and all this stress of me doing this work is going to be over, we can all celebrate right after this. The party starts right after this short 24-minute interlude. <laughs> all right. So I figured with this being the world domination summit and all, I needed a talk that sounded similarly enormous, so I created this one with not just one, but two unicorns to represent its epic status. <laughs> it's called How to Be Rich, Happy, and Save the World, because I figured that would be a goal big enough for unconventional people. But really, this is perfect for me, too, because on the internet, I sometimes get categorized as a personal finance blogger, because I have this blog that talks about how to make personal choices that'll make you richer. But really, now don't put this on Twitter, but I don't really give that much of a shit about your personal finances. <laughs> <laughs> what I care about is how much better a world we're all going to get to live in if we all become a bit more rational uh, with our money. So all this, because money is a really powerful thing. It really has the power to like completely improve the world we live in, or it could also trash it overnight, just depending on what choices we make with that money. A lot of power, and it really boils down to only three amazing facts. Three amazing facts that will make you rich. Now, we're going to begin with a quick list, and then we'll get into the details of each one so we can put this stuff into practice in our own lives. So for ready, we shall begin. Fact number one, almost everybody <laughs> sucks at money. And this includes the middle class, the poor, our financial advisors. This is way funnier than I expected to be. Thank you. Most of our stock market traders and gurus and what we consider to be the rich people, and of course, even our presidential candidates and the mayors of our cities and the people who design our, the cities that we live in, they all suck at money. But what do I mean by that? You're going to have to stay tuned because first we have to cover fact number two. Getting rich enough to retire only takes about 10 years. None of this 45-year nonsense where you retire at 65 or 70 or never, like they keep telling us in the newspapers. And just as an example, here's my own story. You can follow along with the arrows. Here's me at 21 years old, drinking some beer with a buddy because we had just finished engineering school. Geos Travis, if you're watching this. Next, here's me about halfway through my career at 26, rocking a little low-key Satan costume in my cubicle one afternoon. <laughs> because it was Halloween, <laughs> halfway through my career. Then, at the bottom, there's me at 31, freshly retired, enjoying a beach on Hawaii with some friends on a kayak trip. And then fast forwarding another 10 years, here's me very recently on another beach with some more friends, a bit less good looking, but uh, at least I'm still retired and still having a good time. And it's not just me who has this early retirement superpower. Most of us in the United States and other rich countries have options like this open to us. That's fact number two. Fact number three. Work is better when you don't need the money. Now, it's wonderful to become rich enough to retire. But what if you don't want to retire because you can't imagine yourself sitting around all day? Well, I agree. Because you're watching this talk, all of us are going to become quite wealthy at a surprisingly young age. So congratulations on that. But you're probably going to keep working. You just might choose to do different work. And you're, probably, you're definitely going to have a lot more fun doing it, because work is better when you don't need the money. So before we go any further, we should probably take a step back, and I can explain to you who I am and why I could think I'm qualified to change the diapers of the entire rich world like this. <laughs> On the internet, my name is Mr. Money Mustache. 
And these days, I'm an accidental, part-time lifestyle guru and the leader of an ironic, fake cult that is called mustachianism. And 15 years ago, I had a dream. My girlfriend and I had been together for a while, and things were getting serious, and we were figuring we'd probably get married eventually, and we'd probably have kids eventually. But we both wanted to be free from the need to work before our first baby was born. I wanted to be a super dad. I've always idolized the idea of a super dad, and she wanted to be a super mom. Now, luckily, we both grew up in Canada, so nobody had told us that this is actually impossible. <laughs> so we did it. <laughs> we took the 10-year path to early retirement. I graduated, got a job, worked really hard, rode bikes, rode my bike to work, drank beers, fixed up my house, learned about the stock market and investing, and was able to retire just before my 31st birthday, and not too long after, our baby boy was born. So, The goal was reached. I was a super dad. We were both super parents. We played together as a family on the weekends, but also on the weekdays. We went on all these big trips together. I read my little son hundreds of big books. We went on, I taught him how to read and how to ride bikes and later music and math and physics and all this stuff. It's been a great dream. It's been a wonderful 10 years together. And now we have this awesome little 10-year-old guy. But it still wasn't very easy, because it turns out that raising a kid is surprisingly hard. <laughs> Who knew? And I can imagine that raising more kids is correspondingly harder. <laughs> But shit, we were sure glad we didn't have to commute to two office jobs and like, perform in these mega software careers at the same time as trying to do all this stuff. But meanwhile, so all this was going on, and instead of the 10-year path to retirement, our friends and former co-workers were on a completely different path. They were on the 10-year path to still Brokesville. And that goes something like this. You graduate with huge student loans, and then you get your first job, then you buy your first car, but it's a brand new one, so you buy it on credit, and then you go out to Friday night, happy hour every Friday, and you go out to lunch every day, and you spend hundreds of dollars every time. Eventually, you might meet somebody special, so it's time to get married, and you spend $25,000 on a wedding. Then you buy your first house, with almost no money down, because who could ever save up $25,000 for a down payment? <laughs> then later, you have to upgrade your house, and then later upgrade your car to a bigger one, with a bigger car loan. And along the way, you're probably getting yourself some nice treats, like $2,500 road bikes and $3,000 mountain bikes. And before you know it, you're 30 years old, and then 35 years old, and 45 years old, and you still have no money. And this might sound pretty familiar, because it's what everybody does. This is the standard definition of a prosperous American middle-class life. Pardon me, let's all have a drink. <laughs> so while all this was happening, a funny thing happened to me in the area of work. And that strange thing is that I kept doing it. I mean, I worked all those years in the cubicle so I could escape the cubicle. But once I retired, it only freed me up to do stuff I love to do even more. In my case, that was carpentry and building houses. So I started this small house-building company, and then I ran that until it wasn't fun anymore. And then more recently, I built my own house, which is this one in the picture, and that was extremely fun. So I'm going to keep doing stuff like that forever. And somewhere in these 10 years since retirement, I started, started writing, which has led to the part-time lifestyle guru career, which has brought me here today. And obviously, that was worthwhile. And then let's do stuff like this picture on the bottom, which is an event called Camp Mustache in Seattle, just back in, uh, <laughs> back in June. And of course, some of this stuff over the years has lost money, and other things have made money. So overall, I've been getting further and further ahead. So I've really hit the big time now, like cha-ching! Complete financial freedom. Finally, I don't have to be frugal anymore. And with all this extra freedom, what am I doing? What I have been doing is just spending more time out in the hot sun doing manual labor. Because it turns out work is good for its own sake. Work is better when you don't need the money. So with all that summary behind us, we can finally move on, press the rock and roll button, and find out how we can all get rich. Back to part number one, then. What exactly do I mean when I say that you suck at money? Well, it's simple. Any money that you spend that does not make you happier is wasted. And research shows this ends up being most of our money. The reason is that most of us predict the wrong stuff about our purchases. To understand this, it helps to, a lot of it comes from a big misunderstanding about luxury itself. Most of us assume, assume that luxury products and showing off our wealth 
is preferable to good old-fashioned hard work in solving our own problems. We all say stuff like, well, of course a life of luxury is better. If that weren't true, why did they invent luxury in the first place? The kings and queens had figured this out generations ago. Even I used to think this. Like back when I was 21 years old, my goals and hopes and desires were completely different from the stuff I value here at age 41. I was much more materialistic back then. In fact, if I hadn't changed my ways, I'd probably be living in a huge, fancy house with a four-car garage right now, maybe outfitted with high-end cars. But I would have no money, and I would probably be a lot less happy because I wouldn't have bought my freedom, and I wouldn't have been able to enjoy those 10 years that we've done so much, we've enjoyed so much these past 10 years. I would be just another person who sucks at money. So really, to not suck at money, it helps to think of it like this. The purpose of life and work and dating and all this other stuff we do is logically only one thing. It's to be happy. It's to lead the best and most satisfying life that you can possibly lead. Now, you could argue other stuff, like the purpose of life is reproduction. You know, we're a living organism. We need to make copies of ourselves. And that's kind of true. I mean, raising kids can be a factor in your happiness, but there is such thing as enough kids. Kids aren't for everybody. <laughs> you could also argue that just thinking about yourself is selfish, and you should help other people. And this is true. You really should help other people. It's a great thing to do with your time. But it turns out that helping other people and making them feel better makes you feel better, too. And feeling better is just a fancy way of saying being happy, which brings us right back to the smiley face, the actual logical purpose of life. But what does all this have to do with money? You could think of it this way. Imagine that you're this caveman stick figure. You've got a nice, <laughs> got a nice fire there, access to nature. Is it possible for this guy to be happy? Well, maybe. But maybe it gets freezing cold at night, or maybe there's dangerous animals in the area. So we expand his lifestyle just a little bit. We'll give him some shelter. Is this a complete life for our caveman stick figure? Cheers. Well, obviously not, because one of the basic needs is not met, which is food. So we'll give some food to the man. Is this a complete life? It's getting better, but most of us benefit from companionship which I have represented here with this stick figure diagram of my wife. <laughs> now, what you have here, especially if these people are part of a village with strong social ties, really is the complete picture for human happiness, because they can laugh and love and learn and raise babies and actualize themselves and solve problems and create music together, all this stuff. And that makes sense, because most of human existence has been spent in these conditions, about 99% of it. It's just that we weren't around to see that. But just for a um, thought experiment, let's expand it a little further. Suppose Mr. and Mrs. Stickfigure hit the big time, and they expand their lifestyle a little more. <laughs> so now they've got a nice symmetrical mansion with a Bentley and a Mercedes and a fountain there. Are they happier now that they've left the village of the sick people? Well, maybe. But maybe not, because they've probably severed a lot of social ties when they moved out to the country like this. But just to keep going, let's see if we make things a little better for them. What if they get a few more Bentleys, a few more Benzes, and some butlers to help out with all the hard work of maintaining this compound? Does this make them happier now that they have to put less effort into their lives? And if so, we should probably add a bed, because what could be better than lying in bed and having everybody serve you stuff and you could just gaze out at your luxury empire? And if that's better, we should probably add a bedpan and a catheter as well. <laughs> because what could be better than lying in bed all day and never even having to get out of that bed? And we could add a big TV so you could watch the world go by as you lie there. Now, hopefully, at some point, this fantasy broke, even though it's getting a little bit close to American life. And that's because adding more fancy shit and taking away effort from your life is not the path to a better life. And the reason is that effort and learning and all this other stuff that we've figured out by studying it in recent decades is really the stuff that makes us happier. Now, if you check out this next slide, I've put these things into hexagons so they look scientific. These are the... Th <laughs> <laughs> these are the things 
the psychologists, and a lot of... <laughs> Thank you, guys. This is going way better than I expected. <laughs> All right, so these are the things that psychologists have figured out actually have an effect on human happiness. You've got friendship, freedom, health, meaningful work, there's that word again, privacy, a philosophy of life, which is what helps you decide how to react when things go wrong, and that's something that's missing in a lot of our lives, and of course, community, access to a network of friendly people. And as it turns out, all of these scientific hexagons were covered way back here in the village of the stick people, because they could laugh and learn and solve problems and have relationships and all that. And meanwhile, whenever I show up in the news, poor old Mr. Money Mustache, everybody starts complaining, they're like, that guy is crazy. I could never live a life like I could never lead a life like that. Hardcore frugal. I hear they try to live on 25,000 a year. They must be using like leaves and rocks for the toilet paper. <laughs> Which is obviously nonsense. I mean, here's a picture of me enjoying my brand new spatula and frying pan in this badass kitchen that I got to make myself. This is way more than the stick people have, and that's the whole point. Because even a life at the bottom of the US spending scale is still way more than enough to be happy, as long as you spend it on the right stuff. And if my life at $25,000 is enough to be happy, what about all these people who spend $50,000 or $100,000 or $200,000 and up and still claim they can't make enough to reduce their stress levels or they'll never have enough to retire? What are they missing? What this means is that we are living in a trap. It's so serious, there should be a warning label on every luxury product, like warning the Dalai Lama has determined this product does not bring extra happiness. <laughs> and it's because they've neglected this basic truth that extra luxury products are not bringing us happiness. But yet, every financial advisor and newspaper journalist and politician is still stuck in this assumption that they do. They're all saying stuff like, well... Uh, I forgot my next line. Okay, anyway, the next part is, we have wasted trillions of dollars <laughs> on stuff like suburban highways and like sprawling suburbs with no, no soul in them and stupid cars and trucks to drive back and forth on them every day, when really we would have been happier just living in a small village or living in smaller places within walking distance of each other and access to nature. And that means most of our personal spending and our government spending could be much more efficient if we could just learn not to suck at money so much. So with that all behind our belt, we're ready to move on to part two. Can I really become rich enough to retire in 10 years instead of 45 years? And if so, how the feather could I possibly do this? <laughs> and the secret does not require a huge income, and it's not to become a fancy, genius stock market investor. And it doesn't require you to buy my amazing books or courses or DVD, DVD sets, because I don't have anything for sale. <laughs> the secret is just to spend much less than you earn. And it's probably like, oh, is that the answer? Because everyone says, well, I can't do that. That would make me sad. I love my pickup truck. But that's wrong. We already know, we already established that happiness is the only logical pursuit. <laughs> and we also established that buying extra luxury stuff does not bring us more happiness. And this is where something comes in that I like to call the shockingly simple math of early retirement. And what this tells us is that your mandatory working career depends on only one factor. To understand it, you might consider the following story. On the one side, you have this hard-working carpenter guy who happens to look a lot like my friend Mike. Now, Mike <laughs> works hard and part-time and maybe brings in about $40,000 a year. And he has a happy life that costs him about $36,000 a year, which leaves him saving $4,000. On the other side, we have a wealthy doctor guy named George. <laughs> George brings in $400,000 a year, but because he has a doctor lifestyle, it's very expensive. He has a giant house, a fleet of Lexus SUVs, golf club memberships, and so on. But he doesn't manage to spend all of it, and still there's $40,000 left over at the end of each year, 10 times as much as Mike is saving. Given this information, which one of these two guys do you think would be wealthy enough to retire, assuming they want to continue living their same lifestyle, lifestyle after retirement? The surprising answer is they would have the same retirement date, exactly the same. How could this be? 
Well, to understand that, it helps to take a look at this next graph, which is my favorite retirement calculator, or a prison sentence calculator, <laughs> straight off my website. And as you can see, it's a long list of bars that start out huge on the left and slide nicely down as you move to the right. Now, this is a graph of how long you have to work. It turns out the only thing that controls how long you have to work is how much of your paycheck you can save after tax as a percentage of your take-home pay. Now, if you look carefully, one of these bars says United States on it, and it's at around 6%. That means the average American saves 6% of their income, spends the other 94%, and thus is on track to retire in about 60 years, which is the same as never. <laughs> the only thing that saves us is our social security program, or inheritances, or little corner cases. Our savings rate is not big enough, and therein lies the problem. But if you just start making small changes, like just switching from the ridiculous cars and trucks that most of us buy with an average price of $30,000 to something reasonable, like buying a used Honda off of Craigslist, for example, with money that maybe you actually have, can already bring you up to a savings rate of 20%, which cuts 20 years off of your prison sentence. Learning to make a good meal at home and not going out to dinner five to seven nights a week, like many people do in my kind of age range, makes another big notch. Learning to ride a bike and designing your life so you're not commuting back and forth 15,000 miles like the average American actually does, according to the statistics, brings you up another giant notch. And just making a few other changes, like not air conditioning the crap out of your house 24 hours a day and doing 50 loads of laundry for one person will bring you the rest of the way there. And if you can get to a savings rate around 64%, just as an example, that puts you to a career that's under 11 years. And that's exactly what I did during my career in software, using only my superpowers as naive Canadian man. <laughs> I mean, here I was, thinking I was living this big, fancy life in my new American job, but because I only managed to spend part of my paycheck on fancy stuff, the rest of it built up, and that left me free to retire before my first baby was born. Now, if I can do that, this actually works at almost every income level, by the way, and Lower incomes, it's even more important to become efficient at saving. But it's almost effortlessly easy for those of us with higher incomes. And yet, somehow, the higher income people are still almost as broke and stuck working almost as long as those of us with average incomes. So if you got all that down pat, you're finally ready for part three. We're on the home stretch. Work is better when you don't need the money. Now, it's wonderful to become rich enough to retire, as I said. And a lot of people, when presented with my unavoidable logic that early retirement is not as difficult as they thought, they pull out one final excuse. They're like, but I like my job. I'm a doctor, an entrepreneur, or some other cool thing. I could never retire. I don't know what I'd do if I retired. So I can keep spending all my money on crap, right? <laughs> and of course, the answer is no. You ignore Mr. Money Mustache's advice at your own peril. <laughs> because no matter what your job, it gets way better if you don't need the money. I mean, put it this way, what if you woke up tomorrow and found a billion dollars sitting next to you in a bag on the hotel bed? Would you change anything about your job? Maybe at least award yourself three-day weekends or flexible work hours? Or would you consider saying yes if your favorite sister or your best friend called you up and invited you on a life-changing three-month vacation and you had to take off quickly? If you're an entrepreneur, would you consider maybe being a bit more innovative with your company or treating your employees or your customers a little bit better? Well, it really depends on how much you love your work, because we're really talking about two different things when we talk about work and money. The purpose of work is to create. It is to fuel your soul, whereas the purpose of earning money is to have enough money. How much is enough? Well, enough to max out your happiness. After that, getting any more money will not make any difference in your happiness. Now, the good news is this is not the death bell of your career. It's more like the birth announcement, because if you're still working when you don't need the money, you have no choice but to do that work truthfully. Almost done. Now, I like to call this concept authenticity, and it's the most powerful form of marketing. You can put that on Twitter if you want. <laughs> it is your customers can smell it a mile away. 
And that's how I feel about this guy. I mean, if people sense that you're not sucking every last dollar out of every transaction when you're conducting business with them, and you don't really even seem to care about making too much money on, on them, they come to realize, holy shit, this person is doing this out of love. And that's how I feel about the guy in this picture, Elon Musk. Because Elon, yeah, right on. Elon had over $165 million in cash when he sold PayPal back in 2002. The guy was like 31 years old now, then, and that's about the same age I was when I quit my career as a software engineer with obviously much less money. Now, $165 million is more than enough money to do whatever you like for the rest of your life in style. Like Elon could be floating around in a jet-powered hot tub <laughs> filled, with, <laughs> filled with attractive people like sipping martinis and looking down at us right now over the cloud tops. But instead of that, he plowed all this money back into stuff like Tesla Motors, SolarCity, SpaceX to do what he felt would be the best thing to positively impact the future of humanity. Now, whether you agree with his business strategies or not, you have to agree that this guy is for real. And his customers feel the same way too, and his investors. And this is why Tesla is worth about the same amount as on the stock market as General Motors, even though GM still sells $300, 300 times as many cars as Tesla for now. People are excited about an authentic entrepreneur. They line up to buy your products, like the lineup of raving customers to buy the Tesla Model 3 when it came out earlier this year. This is way better than just being another internet trickster who builds a deep, slippery email funnel and sells $300 eBooks about how to sell $300 eBooks to anybody. <laughs> if you can get yourself financially independent, not only does it give you the power to eliminate most of the bullshit from your life, but it forces your life's work to become more truthful. Now, this shit really matters. Because in the world today, there are people who grind away like little gears until they die. And then there are people who do pretty well for themselves, but leave nothing more than a trail of conspicuous consumption, like empty champagne bottles, depreciated luxury cars and yachts and vacation homes. And then there are people who leave a lasting difference. Now, there's a classic Greek proverb which goes something like, a society grows great only when the old people plant trees even when they know they won't be around to enjoy the shade of those trees. And that's why the title of this talk ends with, and save the world. Because if you can get yourself free from the need for money, you have no choice but to do work that is better for you and better for the world. I mean, sure, people will like you more and you'll be richer and happier, but if you're doing it for love instead of money, you'll have no choice but to do a better job. Thanks, guys. <laughs>